Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Victoria Sears. She's an engineer at Mayo Clinic, and she's going to talk about clinical work workflow at Mayo Clinic and efficiencies using a manufacturing execution system. Hi, Victoria. Hello. Thanks for having me, and thank you for the introduction. And everyone could see my screen all right so far. All right, so um, I'll begin. Um, so my name is Victoria Sears, or also go by Tori. I'm a clinical engineer at the Anatomic Modeling Unit at Mayo Clinic. Um, I'm primarily focused on uh, cranial maxillofacial applications, um, but I also have um, took over the workflow project after Amy Alexander has moved on to a different role in Mayo Clinic. So today, throughout this, um, throughout this presentation, I will introduce the anatomic modeling unit as well as our typical clinical workflow. We will then dive into how we have historically tracked our orders and how um, they were not long-term solutions. And then we'll lead into the integration of a customizable manufacturing execution system where we hope to, and where we hope to see the future state will be. So the Anatomic Modeling Unit, or AMU, is a multidisciplinary team of about 14 dedicated employees, which doesn't include any physicians, residents, students, or anything. Um, we provide innov innovative solutions to clinical challenges utilizing additive manufacturing capabilities. We are primarily focused on point-of-care manufacturing, which refers to the just-in-time creation of diagnostic models um, and medical devices based off of patient medical imaging occurring on site of patient care. With that being said, we're located on the sixth floor of St. Mary's Hospital, just five levels above the operating rooms with 8,000 square feet of manufacturing space. Because of this increased accessibility being on site, it allows for clinicians to bring conceptual ideas to clinical use and short turnaround times and reduce costs. Our um, three main application areas are um, care, education, and research and development. Um, for 3D printing for care, we uh, basically have uh, patient-specific surgical tools and anatomic models. For 3D printing for education, this can be anything from just purely educational um, anatomic models to um, educate patients, or they can be task tra trainers that usually um, we target uh, training residents, new residents. And then we have research and development where we don't do as much in, but we do have the freedom to work on unique non-commercial experimental designs um, proposed by physicians. With these three branches, our main focus of care, our, our main focus remains to be on 3D printing for care. Since this is a conference about additive manufacturing, I'm not going to go into the details of each of the standard technologies. However, um, out of the seven, we do have five present in-house to produce patient-specific anatomic models and surgical tools. With um, We had about 37 printers, printers operating um, nearly all the time during COVID, especially to help out with swab um, production. But currently, uh, since that has uh, stopped, we have about 20 printers currently in operation. A typical clinical order at the AMU requires 10 steps, cycling through a multidisciplinary team of physicians, radiologists, um, engineers, technologists, and um, technicians. We first begin with the clinical care team, identifying a need for a 3D printed anatomic model or patient-specific device. Orders include critical information such as uh, surgical date, uh, what is the core purpose of the model or device, such as do they need to see the tumor margins of um, a, um, a sarcoma in the pelvis area. Um, so, and that also includes any information about like who is the lead surgeon on the case so we can contact them directly if we have any questions. Our medical administrative assistant ensures that all critical information is present and that the turnaround time is doable. And then after that, she also then checks if the patient has already had up-to-date and appropriate imaging for 3D printing, which is typically um, CT or MRI. If not, the radiologists or, or radiologists or radiology technologists, RTs, which I'll 
pretty much called on that for the rest of the presentation, ensure that the correct radiographic imaging is ordered, specifying um, certain acquisition protocols that will produce the most accurate and detailed medical images of the anatomic uh, region of interest. After scanning, we extract data from the medical images to create surface-based 3D models of the patient's anatomy. This process is called segmentation, where we mark an anatomic region of interest on imaging stacks and divide it into anatomic structures. It's primarily done by the RTs who are specialized in CT or MR scanning, but oftentimes the engineers can um, do further uh, segmentation for maybe future um, unique design implications in the uh, final anatomic model or when the work workloads are high. Because these models and devices are being used for diagnostic reasons um, and also can assist the surgeon with their procedures directly in the operating room, a board certified radiologist reviews the contours of segmentation to assure accuracy. Um, they also will do any tumor segmentation as obviously they're very much qualified to do that. And sometimes it's hard for the RTs or engineers to really visualize the extent of that oncologic growth in the patient. After that, the surface-based 3D anatomic model is then converted to a CAD file format and um, is manipulated to, or uh, is further manipulated and can be designed around the patient-specific anatomy. These additional steps are, are not to really deform anything that we are segmenting because obviously we want the most accurate um, CAD files after segmentation, but they're either just going to further accurately portray the anatomy, um, perform su virtual surgical planning, or design patient-specific devices around the anatomy. Uh, after the models and guides are finalized, engineers and printer technicians, which at uh, Mayo Clinic we use the healthcare, healthcare technology management technicians, or HTM, um, we so appropriately select the printing technology associ and associated material. In this decision, many factors uh, must be considered based on the clinical application. For instance, um, is this just a purely anatomic model? So do we need to delineate um, anatomic structures based on color? So do we need to have a printer that's able to do multi multi-colors or more than two at least? Um, also, other things to we have to really worry about here is turnaround time. Since we're directly in the hospital, oftentimes these, and we're a destination medical center, oftentimes these patients will come and be seen Monday and they have surgery, surgery already on Wednesday or Thursday. So that means we'll have to have everything um, segmented, done in CAD, virtually surgically planned, and printed in the matter of maybe 48 hours. So sometimes this uh, turnaround time really determines what printer we are able to use. At this stage, printing is complete and the product is cleaned of any residual manufacturing materials using the OEM's instructions for use and internal standard operating procedures. This is primarily carried out by your HTM technicians. Although we are covered under the practice of medicine, all products still undergo quality assurance steps to ensure that we are delivering a safe, reliable, and accurate product. Between the engineers and printer technicians, this includes visual inspection, um, digital versus visual, physical measurements, as you can see on the screen with the kelpers, and surface scanning to overlay the 3D printed part to the design file. If the anatomic model and guide passes our quality control system, our uh, medical admin notifies, notifies the clinical care team that the order is ready for pickup. And then during delivery, there must be a kind of um, discussion between the clinical care team and the engineers. So we're able to highlight any unique anatomic features on the model, or maybe if we um, had the mandible, which is your DAW, like removable from your top of your skull, um, or also if we're creating any surgical guides, we also want to verbally communicate to the clinical care team how these guides should be used, even though it's also written on a piece of paper. And then lastly, the 10th step, we do have a current billing system set up in-house to charge for 3D printed anatomic models and guides as established by the current category three CPT codes. Um, in addition, the radiologists dictate every case which stores the case summary and model um, or guide purpose in the patient's electronic medical record. 
As you can see, point of care manufacturing is a very detail oriented and meticulous process and requires about four keys to success. Um, these include robust organization, seamless communication, efficiency in moving the order to completion, and thorough and concise documentation. We need, so what would an idea point of care workflow system need to capture? Obviously, we would need the no order information um, from the physician or clinical care team. But on top of that, we also need the patient um, surgical or medical information because we are oftentimes um, creating these models and guides based on us reading into the charts and seeing exactly what these physicians are looking for. Um, that's not always included into the order information. <laughs> And then we would also need to be able to track where what's um, what status is the order in? Is it in segmentation? Is it in 3D printing? And we just need to be able to track that workflow. And then also because we're manufacturing um, devices and anatomic models, we'll need to capture all of the 3D printing information. Because we're producing up to class two medical devices at the AMU, we also need everything to be thoroughly documented. So let's transition into how we first try to achieve a successful workflow system. In the remaining slide, there's not really much need to pay attention to the jumble of words on every chart that I'm going to show, but rather the highlighted elements, whereas I'm trying to just um, show what each of these are um, significantly relaying to help us with our workflow tracking. So during the earlier days, AMU was facing low volumes of orders um, per month with minimal dedicated staff. So simple tables focusing on the clinical order information worked, um, but status was only broken down into work in progress into ready to print with no information about what work in progress actually meant. Did this mean, you know, was it in virtual surgical planning? Was it in segmentation? Was the patient awaiting imaging? Um, it didn't capture that information. And it was also not um, withholding any information based on uh, production. So what printer is it going on to? Um, Although you can see at the top, it does say digital materials, so it was likely a uh, material jetting um, chart. Realizing the gaps, the team began to track their workflow on whiteboards, utilizing, utilizing magnetic strips. Each magnetic strip was dedicated to an order, and the magnetic strip was moved through the workflow to track its prog progress and um, production status. The one thing I do want to highlight is that blue status area there. So it was a huge improvement to um, what we had before where they have little magnets saying um, image acquisition, segmentation, BSP, design. And so they were able to move those orders through that process as well as the process of the production. However, in 2018, clinical orders kind of significantly increased and a more robust system was needed. This led to three different Excel sheets to, in order to attempt um, order information, the status of every order, and all production information. Um, the production information was broken into two sheets. You had a print schedule where the engineers were able to say, hey, I want this order printed on this date. Um, and then we also had a print log, which was, you know, everything that was printed either successfully or failed on the printed printer it was documented lastly in order to streamline clinical orders into the amu and house them within the patient's um, electronic medical record the amu integrated with mayo's um, electronic medical risk record system which is epic after many updates of fine tuning, the dashboard does capture detailed order information, workflow status, and it does attempt to um, enhance communication between staff. But you can see it's still missing that production schedule and information, and that had to be continued to be tracked on separate, separate Excel sheets. So although this EPIC integration has been an amazing progression for the AMU, and it definitely is not going to go away since this is how we um, are able to have the, these orders into the um, patient's record, um, it unfortunately does not stand as the ideal, ideal point of care um, workflow system, which lacking in efficiency, communication, and documentation. It still required the use of multiple documents, verbal handoffs, and did not capture the manufacturing and production information. And again, just to reiterate and really drive this home, because we're manufacturing up to class two medical devices, we also need to be able to capture all information and ownership of steps thoroughly in an organized and concise manner. 
So we need a, a unique solution that could be tailored exactly to our needs. <clears throat> so this led to the investment of a manufacturing execution system. Excuse me for one second. So we have developed a customized dashboard to exactly match our order, order workflow from clinical order submission in Epic through production to all the way to ready to pick up is highlighted in the top box. We began to utilize unique tags to help our team track with um, track what the pre-production status of each order is before progressing through the 3D printing ste um, steps. So these tags can um, be alerting, do we have a patient that has a similar name um, as another patient? Um, is this uh, order awaiting imaging so the patient hasn't been scanned but will be scanned in the near future? Um, so it's just to alert the staff of anything pre-production wise. A customizable order detail form was also created that stores relevant surgical and medical information that is specific to the patient, such as um, their um, um, like uh, their medical number, uh, their age, their gender. So we're all able to capture that information. This order form also documents important pre-production details as well as order milestones. Um, as seen on the left side of the screen, um, you can see that there's notes, so we're able to track when these um, specific milestones are happening. For instance, if I um, need to submit a order to a third-party company for a specific implant, I can document when that happened on that date. Um, and then it also holds more pre-production details, such as what exact CT imaging was used in order to get the anatomic models for our designs. Um, so that's something that needs to be captured in case we have to go back and relook at this um, order. And then um, the manufacturing execution system also offered a more efficient solution to handoffs between groups of staffs using a permissions tool. For instance, let's say the segmenter staff was finished with their segmentation and they need to alert all radiologist staff here in-house that this is ready for um, contour review. So with adding the radiologist staff um, to permissions to the order, it then um, sends out an email to all the radiologists and saying that, hey, this is ready for to be reviewed, to move on to the next step. Engineers can also directly uh, um, attach print files to the order while specifying machine preference, um, material, and quantity in batches, while still also being able to denote print orientation in the individual part levels. This information is then directly relayed to the produ production management tools where the production schedule illustrates what printers are being utilized and what materials are currently loaded in each printer. Using the production Gantt chart, the technicians schedule the engineering design files onto builds using the previously specified printers. Scheduled builds and orders are moved into in progress once the jobs begin on the 3D printer. The order naturally progresses into in in production, both on the production schedule and on the orders dashboard. Once the build has finished, printer technicians specify when the job is complete, indica indicating the per correct print time and material usage. And then I didn't highlight this as much, but you are able to um, say the machine technician that took the job off the bill, so you have that documentation of ownership of who touched the printer. Or if the build has failed, the texts indicate reasons and details as to why, and these parts automatically move back into queue to be scheduled for another build. So once the parts are, are successfully 3D printed, the order um, and the parts naturally progress into post-processing steps in the system. The printer technicians can now specify what post-processing steps were used, such as maybe wet standing, clear coating, um, it was in the UV cure blocks for X amount of time. Um, anything that all, anything and everything needs to be documented to make sure that um, our final product has traceability throughout the manufacturing. Most importantly, they also use this space to document any quality assurance um, measurements and inspections so they can say that it visually passed our um, 
digital in Kelper measurements or if there was anything specifically wrong with the part visibly. If all passes in without damage to the parts, the text record that the parts have successfully completed post-processing, moving the order into ready for pickup. So in the ready for pickup area, our medical admin can then use those unique tabs that we were using before um, the pre-production steps um, to, win, to document when the clinical care team was notified for pickup. And she can also communicate to the radiologist which orders are, re are ready for the official dictation into the patient's electronic medical record and can be pushed through to billing. So because we have tailored a system to capture as much information as possible, the MES analysis tools are assisting us with collecting data about our workload, production, and bottlenecks. For instance, CoAM um, has these great analysis um, pre-made graphs based on your um, filtering. So here we can see the, the unique, unique parts printed by equipment. So out of all of the 20 printers we use, there was 1,219 parts printed over six months, but we're able to then nail down to see, um, although this is unique parts, we can see what printers are being used pretty much the most, which there stands as our HP 580 and um, the Stratus uh, uh, printers as well. It also has allowed us to detect which departments within a uh, Mayo Clinic are utilizing the AMU the most. So I know it's super tiny font and you won't be able to see it as well, but um, that we, I think the most, yep, yeah, the most used um, department is dental specialties followed by orthopedic surgery and then oral maxillofacial surgery. And this is again over analysis of six months. And then we're also able to break down the, no the number of parts printed throughout the year. Um, I only looked at, again, six months, but this kind of shows your slow times in production. So this past October, it showed to be a little bit of a slower month as compared to um, middle of the summer and um, end of the year, which is as predicted in kind of in a clinical setting. And then even further, it has allowed us to track total print times per equipment um, to track when these 3D printers might need maintenance and calibration. So again, pretty much relays with that unique, um, that graph that had the unique parts printed per equipment. Our HP and the Stratasys um, printers, they have the most uh, printing hours compared to all the other ones. So the MES has greatly improved AMU's process tracking by tackling those four keys to success, which is again, organization, communication, efficiency, and documentation. Although the MES has been the closest thing as a one-stop shop for the AMU, our workflow system is still evolving. The MES allowed us to create fields to capture relevant um, medical information, but all of this is currently manually being inputted by our um, medical administrative assistant. And this is not an ideal solution due to the possibility of inputting um, data wrong. We would not want to accidentally input the patient's clinic number off by one digit, but like that is the unfortunate um, feat of like human error that might happen. So the AMU is hopeful for the possibility in future integration of a MES and um, electronic medical record like EPIC to further document and track our unique point of care uh, manufacturing status and workflow. And I want to thank you for my um, for being able to present today. I welcome the floor to any questions. So much, Victoria. It was such an interesting journey that you presented, <laughs> and we already have a few questions, quite quite a few. So I'm gonna go ahead and read them for you. Sure. Amazing presentation. Thank you. Are you able to add the duration of each step in your workflow? Um, yes, yeah, so uh, we do have fields into the customizable form where we're able to track um, how much time segmentation did take. And But this is all um, manually inputted by like say the segmenter. And I will also go in and put that um, in CAD or for my virtual surgical um, planning time with a phys physician. Um, however, it does automatically track, you know, the print time, as you can see on those last couple graphs. Perfect. 
um, are there regulat regulatory limitations to produce the 3D anatomical models used for diagnosis? Um, so I mentioned this a little bit in the talk, but we are fortunately kind of covered under the practice of medicine, although um, there does there is a call for more regulatory um, uh, more regulation in our field because um, even though we are covered in the practice of medicine, we are manufacturing and things could go unfortunately wrong in that area. So we try our best to comply with the FCA regulations, um, especially when we're producing class two medical devices like surgical guides. Um, so we just try our best to exactly do what those medical co device companies are doing. Great. Another question. It seems like MES systems can help a lot. Which challenges need to be solved and uh, make sure 3DP at POC scales? Yeah, I, I agree <laughs> that it does help a lot. <laughs> um, challenges is definitely the highest for us, at least at the point of care, is that integration with the electronic medical record and the manufacturing um, software. And I think another challenge that we really faced when we were going through this process of the um, integration with the CoAM was that, you know, we do have a manufacturing workflow, but also it's a bit different than a traditional manufacturing workflow that you could see at an automotive company. So I think maybe it's something that the, it needs to be a more unique medical solution of an MES solution or system. Um, and I think also just, yeah, it's just more of a unique one because we may not be mass producing um, a certain part all the time. They're usually unique parts for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Hey, thank you very much for the detailed and informative presentation. I would like to ask, which software do you use to convert surface-based 3D model to CAD? Um, so we do use the Materialized Mimics Innovation Package, um, although it, we are a large organization, so it can be a little bit pricey, but we have found that to be um, the most helpful for us at this moment in time. Um, so that is what we use. Mm -hmm. um, in your presentation, I saw a print for kidney in color. I am curious, did you guys at Mayo Clinic transplant a kidney or was it something else? We actually, um, one of our highest ordered models are kidney models. <laughs> um, and it has to do with tumors embedded inside or just uh, around the kidney. So... Um, it's to help with visualizations because during surgery, they cannot, they can't open up the patient completely to be able to see the entire organ. So we're going to give them a model so they're able to know the exact location going into surgery and can have a plan on how to extract that tumor. So more so on that side, although I think we might have had a kidney transplant or two come through our um, <laughs> workflow. Uh, squeezing this last question. Given parts are based on anatomic features and can be difficult to measure, how do you typically approach parts where printed correctly? For example, so do... how do you choose oh, sorry, what dimensions no to measure? <laughs> no worries. So um, I think it's that that's pretty part specific and it's also application specific. So let's say if we're doing a large model of the pelvis, um, they're likely not going to be measuring the exact distance of things. So maybe like the flexibility in our quality control system could be a little bit lax, but if we're producing like a surgical cutting guide, we need that quality to be top notch. So we'll have to, you have to think about the part, where would it most likely to um, fail or bend or warp in the manufacturing 